Everybody, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, or the SABC, has been acknowledged for a significant improvement in how the 2019 general elections were covered, as well as being noted for having more balanced news than previously. According to Media Monitoring Africa's analysis of coverage by media institutions, out of 3,137 items analyzed across television, radio, and online platforms, 99% were found to be balanced and fair. And in a study commissioned by the Reuters Institute, South Africa rates eighth out of 38 countries in terms of trust in news. Respondents found South Africa media effective mm. in holding politicians and businesses to account. This is mm. incredible. And to talk more about this is William Bird, Director of Media Monitoring Africa. And uh, in our Cape Town studio, we've also got Chris Roper, the Deputy CEO of Code of Africa. Chris, welcome in our Cape Town studios. Hi, thank you. And William, good to see you. Welcome uh, here, here into studio as well. So we talked to the stars. I mean, firstly, this, mm. is, this is fantastic mm. news for the SABC. We've come from a very difficult past yes, and, and a not so distant past. The, uh, it was almost yesterday that we were struggling mm. um, with exactly what we are now being applauded for. Um, the data was collected from 61 South African news media. Which other houses were actually monitored? So we monitored most of the uh, major other media t around the country, so all of the, the major online uh, news entities. We looked at uh, ENCA as well. Um, we looked at a range of you know, other different uh, commercial and community broadcasters. So we got a really good sample. And in total, we had 10, 000, just over 10,000 stories uh, over the election period, over a two-and-a-half-month period. So it, we've got a really good set of data. And if you look at that, I mean, all of our media did really well on balance and fairness. But what we saw in 2016 was that uh, the SABC in particular, uh, their credibility was brought into question. For the first time in our democracy, in fact, we found clear evidence of systemic bias on a range of the, 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 the services. Whereas this time, overwhelmingly fair. And, and to get from there to here in such a short space of time when there have been so many clear is issues of editorial interference and attempts to you know, directly interfere with SABC's ability to do its job properly, it really is an incredible achievement, made all the more impressive by the fact that SABC's got no money. So yeah. they did this in a circumstance that's even more difficult and in an environment that's even more difficult. And not only did they have the majority of items fair, overwhelmingly fair, they had a better spread of topics, they had a better spread of regional issues covered, and they also had more citizens' voices. So it's... It's overwhelmingly a good story for the SABC. Fulfilling its mandate at the yes, end of the indeed. day. I mean, this is the, this is the citizens' broadcaster more than it is anything. And I think what, what has been noted during these specific elections was that the voice was given more to the citizens of South Africa than to the politicians. I know that that was what we tried to do. So mm. what you're saying is that was actually achieved. Yeah, I mean, to a large degree, of course, your, your politicians still dominate the, the coverage, as you would expect in an election period. But for the first time ever, we had citizens at 14%. And if you look back at elections before this, you'll find that they sit somewhere, you know, 3%, 2%, somewhere around there. And so to make that significant jump, is mm. it, it, again, it's, it shows a very clear effort that says we want to make sure that we reflect ordinary South Africans' views on, on these elections. Fantastic. We'll talk more to that as well. Chris, let's bring you into the conversation now because... What this, this, this actually does, the report that media monitoring uses, basically spotlights uh, the positive and the blind spots. And obviously mm. they're places that need to be improved. Where did you find that within the SABC and some of the media reporting of the elections, there needs to be improvement? So I lost you there for a second. Um, in, in terms of the, the, obviously we're talking about the highlights and the positives that have come up, but there are also yeah. blind spots. Uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to reporting yeah. from the SABC and media, well, what are those? Yeah, look, I mean, the, the, the big issues are reach and kind of local reporting. And I think that's a, a function of revenue and something William alluded to earlier, where it's very expensive to do great reporting. Mm. And I think that's something that we're going to have to look at quite carefully going forward. And part of that is um, how do news houses fund themselves, um, especially the non-state broadcaster news houses. So one of the problems we found in our survey was that I think only about 28% of people actually go directly to a news organization. Most of them come through the side door um, of yeah. social media. Mm. And uh, in fact, South Africa is the highest country in, surveyed for um, 
use of WhatsApp to spread news. Mm. In fact, it's the only country in the world where WhatsApp use is bigger than Facebook. Wow. So there are all those kinds of issues that news houses are going to have to um, deal with. And I think that also the, um, the story isn't overwhelmingly, I mean, it's overwhelmingly positive for the SABC. So for example, in our survey, the SABC is the most consumed brand uh, in radio, TV, and print. And its reach in South Africa is 60%, which is, which is great. But on the list of trusted brands, it only comes fourth. And mm. in most other countries in the world, the state broadcaster is at number one. Okay. So I think there's a lot of work to be done around building resources and building trust. What, why, why would you say we're at number four? What, what is it that we still need to improve on? I think this could be legacy. And I mean, William is very positive about the, the growth in SABC. I mean, I would expect next year, I would be willing to bet that if the SABC carries on the way it has, as William has documented, that it's going to be pushing up um, in terms of the brand. But also South Africa is very anomalous in that um, News24 has a 70% reach mm. um, and it's the most trusted news brand. Okay. And no other country in the world is there a 70% reach and a 70%, 77% trust in a news brand. So there, there's, I think the what the News24 has got right is the breaking news aspect and the continuing, continuing flow of news. And that's possibly something the SABC is going to have to have a look at as well. Mm. Now, yeah. William, if I may just, just ask you, I mean, we, we, we talk, we're at number four. Who are the other? We've got News24 at number one, number two and three. Do you know who takes those um, positions? No, I've just drawn a blank on that. Chris, Chris can tell you tell you. us? Who's number two, two and three? three are. Uh, it's... It's ENCA and Business Day. Yeah. Okay, all right. So, so those are the yeah. ones that we have to hurdle over. Uh, there were five topics that the, an the analysis focused on. Talk us through them. What are the five? So this is also really interesting. We looked uh, every, for every elections period, you look at the top five topics, and they usually go from political party campaigning, which is stuff that politicians are expected to do. In other words, they go and they speak at rallies. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you look at party politics, which is usually the kind of inner workings and the fights within them. And of course, given the, the, the state that our different parties are in, there's a lot of stories around there. And then uh, IEC logistics. And those, five, those three stories usually account for over 55% of the topics. And here, over 55% of the coverage this year, if you take those top five altogether, they account for 45%, which says that the media themselves, again, uh, are offering us a far greater spread and range of topics than they have before, which is also an incredibly positive finding. So it's not purely about the fact that those three and those five then eat up all of the, the majority of coverage. So usually those top five are about 75%. Now they're about 45%. So mm -hmm. again, it says that we're getting a much broader range of of issues and for the first time we saw issues around service delivery making it into that top five which again is, is well it, it hasn't happened in all the elections we've monitored which yeah. it speaks to the fact that media i guess partly because that was you know one of the few incidents that received overwhelmingly extensive coverage around the alex protests but also about the fact that they are offering different uh, and seeking to provide a more diverse picture yeah um chris Quite interesting looking at what the report is saying here, and I'm just reading it. It argues that the traditional independence shown by the South African media is, is being eroded by a combination of unethical business practices, shoddy journalism, mm. unreliable news. How often are these actual incidences? How often are they, sorry? H how often are these incidences? Oh, oh, right. Well, I mean, you need to break them up. So there's clearly been... Um, a massive erosion in trust in the news because mm. of the Gupta um, news products, NN7, uh, New Age, for example. Uh, Iqbal survey has done immeasurable yeah. damage to independent. Um, and so that's the one thing, that kind of actual calculated misinformation and damage. And by the way, South Africa is third in the world at 70% um, in terms of people who say they find it hard to differentiate between fake news and real news wow. online today. Sure. Um, but the other part of the, that is, is the kind of natural erosion of the professionalism of journalism, you know, because people are trying to do too much, often for good reasons, because they mm. want to cover stories, mm. doing too much, too fast, too quickly, with not enough resources. And the, the massive problem coming down the line for SA media is who's going to pay for media? Yeah. You know, that's. I mean, for me, that's the biggest takeaway of this mm. of this survey is that media subscriptions to media across the world have flatlined, mm. 
Yeah. And also the big problem is that people normally subscribe to only one brand, mm -hmm. which means you can't have a diverse media, which I think we all agree is the essence yeah. of a, a great press. Yeah. So these are the problems coming, coming down the line. It is a big problem. And I know a lot of people say as soon as you see that it's a paid for article, you, uh, you don't even click, you don't even yeah. go further. You just leave it. You look at the headline. And that's the problem is that we live by headlines because you read a headline, a newspaper writes a catchy headline, but the headline may not be reflected in the story, and that's where, that's where you know, the, this fake news spreads and goes. Mm. I want to ask you very quickly, because William, I know you've got mm. to be out of here in, in about a minute's time. Attacks on journalists. This has been something that we saw happening, unfortunately, here in South Africa. I mean, two instances that, that I just think of at the top of my head was the EFF and Karima Brown. Also, Kanita Hunter with, yeah. uh, I think it was the Women's League Secretary General, yep. uh, the NC Women's League, and, and sending her a picture of a machine gun. The recourse and the, 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 the punishment for that, is it enough for the intimidation of journalists? So the short answer is no. And the reason why the report that Chris is part, uh, one of the co-authors of is so critical is, is that it helps put us in a global perspective to see that these aren't unique challenges to South Africa, but that what we are seeing in South Africa, and as much as... Um, so look, I think there's a few things. The first is we need to get uh, far greater levels of trust built in our media because that helps build up respect and, and trust in, in not only the media entities themselves, but also that it's less likely to mean that journalists are going to be attacked, or when they are attacked, that there's far greater public outrage. So the short answer is no. I don't think that we are dealing with that uh, anywhere near the, the level that we need to be seeking to deal with attacks on journalists. Um, I don't think our social media platforms are doing enough specifically around attacks on journalists, and that's something that we've been engaging with them on and will continue to do so. But they obviously are the kind of formal recourses of, of going to court and, and those things, but often they're very expensive and they're quite risky for the journalists because they don't know the outcome of that, obviously. Um, and then the penalties will range between whatever the court decides. So if you look at the, the recent Karima Brown judgment, I think they got costs and they, because he'd already apologised, they said, well, pretty much that's, that, that's what you have to do and you can't do it again. Uh, and we know that SANEF is, has taken the EFF to court as well, and that case will be coming up soon. But we see regular attacks, and it's particularly on women journalists, where yeah. the kind of level and the trolling and the things that are said are really beyond the pale. These are things that are fundamentally unacceptable. And the danger with these things is this, is that it causes journalists to self-censor. The moment they self-censor, you can no longer trust what they say. And then mm. you get into that deepening spiral. And of course, the less money journalists and media entities have to do good news, the less likely they are to produce good news, the less likely they are to produce. So you're on that spiral, that just leads you down into this bottomless pit, which is also why, ironically, you need a public service broadcaster to be functioning well and effectively, because that helps lift up all other media and it gives them a standard to adhere to. And it actually provides a, a buffering mechanism for a lot of the other problems that journalists around yeah. the country entertain. Such truth. William, thank you very, very much for talking to us. William thank Bird you. of Media Monitoring Africa. Chris Roper, can I give you 30 seconds to wrap it up? We obviously are on the right course and I, and I pay particular attention to the SABC. But just that word of advice or caution perhaps that you can give uh, to, to, to the SABC going forward. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can give a, a word of optimism, rather, Good, which is sure. that South Africa is number 31 on the uh, list of countries with press freedom. Uh, we're above the UK and the US, for example. Um, the, our trust in media is at 49%. Sure, it wants to be better than that, but we are one of the best in the world um, at the moment. And I think the flourishing of our state broadcaster and the fact that um, you know, SABC News is the second most um, consumed news brand online after News24. I think all these things are very positive and uh, I mean the, the way the elections played out I think uh, really gave an impetus to SA Media to improve themselves and I think that's where we are right now and it's a fairly encouraging place. Indeed. Chris Roper, thank you very much from Code of Africa talking to us about the coverage of the elections in South Africa but more importantly how the SABC is faring and how far we have come as a broadcaster. All right.